It's exactly a minute after 8 a.m. I'm Arnold Sagawa. This is still uh, morning at NTV. Remember, you can catch the entire show on uh, social media, Facebook and Twitter. That's, of course, uh, at NTV Uganda. Let's uh, talk labor. Uh, an interesting report by uh, the UN does show that uh, close to 1.6 uh, billion people on the entire globe are in the informal sector. More interestingly, what does the pa pandemic, that's of course the COVID-19 pandemic, mean for these uh, 1.6 billion people in the informal sector? And to bring it back home, uh, how about uh, over 70% of Ugandans who are employed in the informal sector? What does a lockdown mean for that, let alone the pandemic as it stands? Uh, joining me for this uh, in-depth conversation to just uh, understand the technicalities of uh, labor law, let alone uh, what we are actually entitled to, is uh, to my immediate left, uh, Ari Naitwe uh, Rakajara, who is a workers' MP. Uh, to my extreme left, we have uh, Agnes uh, Kunihira, who is also a workers' MP. Lady and the gentleman, many thanks for making time to speak to us. Uh, I think, Agnes, uh, uh, let me start with you. Uh, some are arguing that uh, in the past decade, uh, a lot has been achieved, uh, at least uh, Uganda-wise, when it comes to uh, labor movements, some labor laws here and there. I, I don't know if you actually agree with this premise, or it's, uh, it's, it's hardly any gains that have been made in the last 20 years. Thank you very much, presenter. I, I would like to agree that a lot has been achieved through the labor laws. We have the best laws in this country, the only problem we have been having is implementation. But looking at the situation currently, it will take us some time to ensure that we agree, both the employers, the workers, and government. Mm. It is normally a tripartite arrangement. Therefore, as we move on post-COVID, we have to ensure that the rates of the working class should not be violated. I also agree that a number of workers in the country are under the informal sector. That's true, informal sector. Government, the biggest employer in this country, employs between 200 to 300. The remaining are in the private sector. Others are in informal sector, self-employed, engaged in a number of activities. For example, they engaged in issues of border borders, vendors, they are all employed by themselves. So our laws, the unfortunate part, are more focused on those in gainful employment where they earn salaries. So it is high time that government considers the informal sector as a key sector that will help in the development of the country. All right, let me uh, bring you in here. Um, first of all, uh, uh, Agnes has alluded to the fact that uh, the informal sector, yes, it is massive, but uh, th the laws are not particularly tailor-made uh, to suit both the formal and the informal sector. Um, at a time like this when you have a pandemic and suddenly everyone is home, is, is, would this be a perfect time for actually uh, to address some of the shortfalls of uh, our labor laws as they stand? Or did we know these problems long before and now they're just, uh, we are treating the disease because the symptoms are, are even more dire? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate workers in this country and the whole world for the day of, day of uh, Labor Day that is recognized with the wor worldwide. Uh, I also want to really to, again, thank the workers who are still working in these problems, especially the health workers and other workers that are in the field trying to fight COVID. Uh, exactly what you're asking, um, our labor laws have been concentrating on, uh, on uh, not on informal sector so much. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the union labor laws, uh, the Employment Act, all of them have been addressing the formal employment, but they have not been touching so much on informal. Yet, as you said in the beginning, 
the world is taking uh, the, the, the side of informal. Mm. And as the Honorable Agnes said, uh, the border borders and others. And uh, I, I think uh, apart from these good laws that we've been having, we need now to redirect ourselves and make sure we protect these people who are working in the informal sector. Yeah. So, uh, Agnes, uh, let me bring you back here, Honorable. Uh, women, because uh, if, if we were to look at <laughs> this informal sector that uh, I'll, I'll keep bringing back, uh, predominantly many of these are even women. There's a very interesting study that came out recently that showed that uh, Ugandan women are such entrepreneurs that they're second to none on the African continent. I think they were second or first. I, I might need to correct that. Uh, and, and that leaves me wondering, are we even doing enough to uh, hold the hand of, of the women who are at the front line? God knows they're doing all the cross-border trade when it comes to, you know, doing all the uh, crossing borders and get something on the other side and bring it back, you know, that kind of thing. Are we even doing enough, especially at, at a time like this? Thank you very much. Indeed, the women of Uganda are very hardworking. If you take, for example, the WEP program of government, you will find that their performance is at 80% compared to the youth program, where they were given money and they're supposed to return it. Use some of the youth disappeared with money. <laughs> but if you visit all the women groups, you'll find that they're working and they are even paying back mm. the money. Unfortunately, the money is very little. little yeah very little it's not helping them because for example a group is given a group of around 25 people is given 12 million what can 12 million do for an individual because you are supposed to share and move out but also looking at all industries unfortunately women are given the lowest position in all industries go to hotels go to everywhere women are there and they are doing their work perfectly well. So for now, and at our level, it is true that women are the best in doing almost all types of jobs. If you go to markets, they are the majority. If you go to other workplaces, you find that they are majority and doing a lot. Mm. So we need to do a little more. Even we need to add more money to the web program. And post-COVID, a number of women are going to lose jobs, even in the former sector. But uh, th this, this uh, actually leads me to my uh, next question. Maybe uh, both of you can address this. It's mm -hmm. the, the, the need for trade unions. Mm -hmm. Now, one woman mm -hmm. or one Arnold here cannot walk up to, uh, uh, let's say, if my employer said they're going to lay off people. I cannot argue as Arnold alone. But if they're trade unions, mm -hmm. if yes. there's a body that... Uh, uh, can speak yes. for all of us, especially the women, especially the vulnerable groups. If there's a, a body like that, and this leads me to question, are we doing enough, I'm glad you're legislators, yeah. to move uh, such motions to make sure we have a collective voice? Uh, let me start with you, uh, Honorable Ari Nightway, then maybe Agnes can also address this. Yeah, uh, I don't know that, that that's very true. You, the, the importance of the union is to combine uh, your ideas and rights and everything to negotiate. Yeah. But if you are negotiating as a person, sometimes you find you cannot do much. Now, who are we doing enough as trade unionists, apart from being representatives in parliament? Because all of us, we are members of trade unions. We come from different unions. There are unions we have shifted, even the whole world, ILO, has redirected all unions to target informal sector. Mm. So now we, we, you find most of the unions now are going into uh, uh, are going into 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 More informal sector. Yeah. Uh, for example, like a union like Transport Union. Transport Union is organizing all border border stages, and all border border un whatever members are now most of them are in the unions. Mm. When you see the market, the usual trade union, usually do not target like markets and what. 
today we have we, we have a union in the market led by Kayongo and is a trade unionist and a member of the of the union and, and they have a very big number of membership and, uh, so we we have changed the style because we know now challenges in workplaces are in the informal sector so as as, as union members we have redirected ourselves we are moving into informal sector and we are organizing all informal sector workers. So, and, and, and when you see, it is market, it is transport, it is yeah. other areas. So we have redirected ourselves. And of recent, yeah. if you see the issues of, of transport, uh, border, border stages, what those four was, the unions are now in the center stage. Honorable Agnes, uh, do you also uh, agree, well, I, I, I'm sure you do agree, but uh, are we actually doing enough to make sure that uh, this voice is heard, let alone uh, moved across the street here on uh, 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 where we are to Parliament, to make sure that uh, this, these voices are actually uh, heard? Thank you so much. I, I think I want to take you back. Before the 1995 Constitution, it was very easy to recruit as many members as you can. In fact, by that time, a number of organizations had what they called a closed shop. Yeah. You'd come to NTV and say, can you all join? And you, you all Good. agreed to become members. <laughs> when the constitution was amended, there is, it is now option. A worker may choose to join or not to join. So we have been to workplaces where some people said, what are we going to benefit? Yeah. Some don't know that they are going to benefit. In fact, I've also seen it with you media people. I've tried to <laughs> engage a number of them. I've tried to engage a number of them, and you find they are reluctant. They don't know the importance. But we have tried to engage as many people as we can. As my colleague has already mentioned, that we, are also, we have also gone to the informal sector, and we are recruiting. I will also give you an example that Markets Union is part of the one of the unions that we, now we are helping markets. Recently, uh, one of our colleagues moved even a bill to amend the Market Act that was put in place in 1940s to ensure that all the issues of workers are also considered mm. in that law. So that is how we are trying to help members out there and also to encourage them to join unions. But we need to do a little more to make sure we are able to convince, to reach out to most of the workers to understand the importance of collective agreement. Because when you are alone, mm. even here, you can't negotiate your, for yourself. Uh, definitely. Uh, let's uh, bring in uh, Arnold Kwesiga, who is the coordinator of uh, UCCA, to uh, just uh, join the conversation. He's uh, joining us via uh, Zoom. Um, Arnold, I, I want you to just uh, speak to this, the need uh, for trade unions uh, as a collective voice, as a, a collective uh, negotiator of sorts, and uh, what the honorable members here in the studio have actually mentioned. I know you do agree, but uh, also the fact that uh, maybe many of the people in the informal sector are utterly oblivious to what their rights are to start with. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sega, for hosting uh, me this morning and uh, the members of parliament speaking on workers' rights. Uh, some of the issues that they've raised are really pertinent, uh, largely because of the, the nature of uh, a lot of the work we do uh, uh, or the nature of employment that we have. Uh, but the challenges that we have with the labor uh, 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 laws is that a lot of them focus basically on the informal sector. and. Uh, Yet a lot of our workers tend to be in an informalized way or an informalized uh, mode of operation. When it comes to the labor unions, one way we, we, you get a challenge on the organization bit of it, but also looking at the, the, the strength and credibility of some of the labor unions that they do measure, but also how they operate and how they do protect maybe the, the workers' rights. Uh, you have, we have continuously seen a lot of uh, uh, issues with some of the strong unions, even when you talk about, let's say, teachers' unions or medical workers' unions or uh, uh, Macquarie University, you know, staff unions, when you get you continuously get issues that tend to arise around uh, 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 bribery, pursuit of personal interests of some of the leadership, intimidation and manipulation when it comes, especially from the political angles, so that it, it kind of renders the 
the ability of some of these unions to 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 effectively represent their, their, their union members. And so many times you look at what interests are they pushing forward or how the, you know, the various threats that tend to, 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 to be thrown at them affect their effective way of uh, pushing forward uh, membership of workers' rights. And so it becomes a huge concern on even issues to do with collective bargaining or even uh, collective representation of workers' issues that may or must be able to, to, to must be put forward to push for uh, protection of workers' rights. But a lot of challenges that you continuously see is that we have uh, the informal sector and the, the way it operates, but also the way we have casualized the labor, uh, uh, even in markets that they talk about, uh, even in uh, uh, manufacturing and production centers where there is no strong policy and legal protective cover uh, uh, of employees because a lot of them are looked at as casual or informal, that they don't even have a, right. a protection of the rights, of the labor laws that we have in the country. Arnold, uh, thank you for that. Let's uh, bring it back to the studio. Uh, uh, Honorable MPs, uh, let's, uh, I think the lockdown has been uh, quite an eye-opener because uh, when you look at the list of uh, maybe essential, quote-unquote, uh, personnel, it's uh, very interesting that th these are not the guys who are uh, earning the, the big bucks, you know. They're not the guys who are making the big money, you know. Uh, and, and this leaves me wondering, at a time like this, on a day like this, is it, and I'm not uh, lobbying for the media here, <laughs> is it time for us to maybe uh, realign ourselves? And, and I, again, allude to the people in the markets, because, you know, you, we've seen uh, photographs of the lady who had, had to uh, sleep with a mosquito net, you know, be, and and where does she come in in this picture? As as we have a big celebration uh, in the past years for the first of May for Labor Day, you know, where's that lady in the market in this conversation? As be, away from uh, you know going to Kololo and we celebrate and do a march, how do we reach that person? Do they even know their rights to start with? Thank you so much. Uh, I I want I, to. I think agree. you can both uh, speak to this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to agree with Arnold that uh, much as we have good laws, we have had issues of implementation. He has also raised the very serious issue of casualization of labor. And it is my appeal even to government. Government must take keen interest. If you visit most of these companies, they are employing 90% as casuals, even skilled labor. Mm. So government, in a way, is losing in terms of payee. Mm. Also, th that type of employment creates, creates the working poor. You are not saving. Mm. Yes, you are not saving because you are not entitled. You are not entitled to treatment at a workplace. If you are sick and absent, you will not be paid for that particular day. Mm. So workers are suffering. But the good thing to Arnold is we have brought an amendment to the Employment Bill, to Employment Act, to ensure that the issues of casualization of labor are clearly addressed, to avoid creating the working poor, people who will retire and have nothing. In fact, even right now, during this pandemic, they are the most suffering people. And you know they are not recognized both even at even they are not counted among the vulnerables. The area people know, the village people know you are working, mm -hmm. but you have been earning 5,000 per day, and that's how you have been uh, surviving. Then when we go to the market woman, yeah. as you said that, in fact, those who earn less are now the most essential people. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> when you look at these market people, for them they're even entitled to come and stay around for you, a manager in a company or in an organization, you may be forced to work at home. So we, that's why we are think, thinking that we must refocus ourselves to ensure that all these workers are now going to be protected. But also even looking to the theme of today where they are talking of uh, providing financial services, I think those are most of key areas that government should look at. They shouldn't look at the big companies, giving tax holidays, they should look at helping the young people in the informal sector to come up and do some of the issues, some of the production. Mm. For example, people can make soap, people can do what? Even these sanitizers, 
those small, small groups can make those things. So they just need to be helped with financial. Uh, uh, Honorable uh, Arun, I, I saw you in argument. Yes, yeah, I see the problem. Uh, as you said clearly, do they know even their rights? Mm. You know, we have this culture in Uganda where we don't concentrate on very important issues. <laughs> Everybody wakes up in the morning running to get something and yeah. go back home. And uh, meetings, what, even if the union calls a meeting in the market, this person is not concentrating. He will not even attend. Because for him, he knows he's going to sell either his uh, second hand clothes or food and go home. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what, what they understand. As you said, COVID-19, people must wake up. Some organizations, even big organizations, I'm told New Vision has, have cut uh, the salaries of the workers. I don't think New Vision has a, a CBA. They, I don't think they have ever negotiated with the employers as a team. So whatever the management will decide, they will be affected. And they, as long as you don't have anything on, on paper that you agreed that when you are to cut my salary, the following will be done. Yeah. That if I'm to be laid off, the following things must be followed. And, and the, about the ignorance, about the labor laws, even big organizations, workers don't pay attention to such issues. I believe even New Vision uh, in uh, NTV. <laughs> I don't know whether you have any collective bargaining agreement. <laughs> yes, we have, a, we, we have a big union of our own. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, you, you but may call it a union which uh, is not registered. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the letter you will realize that you need it. Honorable so, uh, Renaitre, yes, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I definitely hear you. Uh, yes. First of all, uh, to uh, not get in trouble with uh, our regulator, yes. uh, I need to uh, make it very clear that uh, uh, we cannot confirm those reports uh, yes. on New Vision and uh, we'd have to uh, speak to uh, Mr. Kabushenga to give us uh, the, uh, the forward guidance yeah. of whether or not they have that. But uh, it's all in good faith. Uh, it is Labor Day, and uh, the Honorable here is uh, uh, just uh, giving out scenarios. Um, let's uh, uh, go back to uh, Arnold. Arnold Kwesiga, uh, you've, uh, you've heard some of these uh, pertinent issues that uh, the Honorable members are uh, alluding to, the fact that... Uh, Yes, there might be some oblivion. Uh, Honorable Ari Nightway is also saying, you know, at times you, you might call a meeting, let's say, in a market. Uh, people don't even show up. Again, it's the hand-to-mouth and the selective amnesia that we've had as Ugandans for the, the past while. Um, uh, talk to me about whether or not uh, COVID-19 does present maybe an opportunity to reamend uh, some of the past flaws, or it, is it really a, a a pandemic of a problem that we cannot fix with a quick fix in maybe a year or two? Um, uh, thanks again. Really, this pandemic has uh, largely really reawakened broad discussions around work, but also uh, how we do categorize some of this work. Because as you can see, a lot of the measures that were taken or restrictions that the government took kind of categorized essential services and non-essential services. But also you get to understand, even when there are clear orders to say work from home, uh, you kind of question a lot of, like I, I mentioned earlier, a lot of our workers or employees tend to be in the informal sector or you know, either a production or manufacturing or trading. You know, we have very huge uh, uh, traders from you know uh, either importing or exporting, but also uh, Chikubo people. And so when you when you try to to create this work from home due to the pandemic, what does that mean, and who does it cover? Because a lot of the essential uh, uh, services might actually require client uh, engagement or service delivery, uh, and and that that are not very capable of working from home. But also you have situations of do we and and and. Uh, the members had alluded or earlier, I think it was uh, Ethan, do we have the tools and the resources to work from home or are even our uh, employers willing to pay much more than they were, they were, they were paying on a monthly basis to ensure that we work from home or provide us the tools? So this pandemic question, you know, raises a number of questions uh, 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 on how we work as, a, as well as employees, right. but also as uh, companies, but also I think there's going to be re-strategizing on what 
measures can be put in place for people to be productive even when they are not in office. And I think it's one of the steps that most organizations will be looking at uh, going forward. How do you ensure uh, a productivity? Right. But the, the, the pertinent issues that we need to be interrogating is how do we protect or ensure social protection or even social and economic protection of the inform of sector workers? Because they are not, we, we understand that huge, huge uh, 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 challenge that we are seeing but with the lockdown and the and the and the various restrictions, the impact it has had on businesses, small, medium enterprises, uh, even some co big corporations. When you get to see these continuous uh, memos and statements that are being put out, where either laying off staff or terminating some of them, or you know cutting salaries, it kind of questions or brings together a huge a concern on what economic response we have for you know, uh, strained businesses or strained uh, companies that cannot work because one, they have been categorized as non essential. And so they cannot continuously produce or right. manufacture or engage in the services they are already do engage in. But then what measures are being put in place by the state to ensure that this does not strain the businesses or even uh, 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 shut them down, but also the resultant you know, effect it has on employees because if a company cannot meet its obligations, then there is no need or there is no way it's going to meet the obligation it has towards their uh, employees. And one of the things that we see, even beyond you know the big corporations that you've been mentioning that have issued statements of uh, you know uh, we are laying off or we are cutting salaries or what, there is a huge number of people in the informal sector that don't even have the luxury of having a contract to negotiate. But they have been working in a, in such a manner that either they are paid on a weekly basis or they are paid daily uh, or sometimes they are paid monthly. But it's more of a one-on-one, -on -one and there is no uh, a, a big contractual a negotiation ability, or even right. in a union of sort, that helps them deal with, uh, with with this kind of pandemic. And those are key constituencies that we need to be thinking about because they are the majority of of, of the of the workforce. And so, as long as you have no negotiating power even when contracts are being frustrated or contracts are being suspended how does then the state and these various agencies and the workers mps there have discussions around protecting the majority because it has a ripple effect on their families on the other uh, 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 domestic uh, uh, employees that they may have that if they cannot get a job or if they are not getting a, sus a salary or if they have been suspended or, or, or contracts frustrated how then do they address the other obligations that arise if they are. Right. So it is some of those discussions that need to be had because of that large group of people that are not even uh, taken care of with the current legal and policy framework around. Arnold, uh, Arnold many thanks for that. I'm uh, going to come back to you in just a few. Uh, uh, in, back in the studio, let's uh, talk about maybe the elephant in the room. He's raised some big points there. Uh, we could talk about the informal sector and uh, the lack of uh, uh, some of the, the laws to actually guide this still tomorrow but uh, I think for me the biggest issue would come back to legislation uh, why do I bring this up the minimum wage bill uh, this was uh, uh, discussed in the parliament it was uh, sent forth to the president and he rejected to sign it this was uh, around August last year now this for me is the elephant among the biggest elephants in the room we could talk about labor laws we could talk about uh, 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 the former sector till tomorrow, but until there is uh, a law and an act saying you cannot do this and you must pay someone this much, then we might be wasting our time. And we'll be having this discussion come next May 1st in uh, 2021 and laugh mm -hmm. about how COVID-19 was here the previous year. Now, uh, let me start with you, Honorable Ari Nightwick. Uh, the minimum wage bill, is this the perfect window to actually address this? Uh, I think all of you might have to speak to this uh, before you wind up. Yeah, um, the minimum wage bill, I think, was going to solve a lot of problems. First of all, uh, it, 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 is, it is very interesting that you find you live, you, you live the whole business of survival of this worker in the hands of the, of the employer who has all the capacity to suppress you. Is the judge, is the jury, is, is the janitor, is, is everything. everything. Mm. Now, if the government does not recognize that and set at least the minimum, where the, you are weak, because you are weak as an employee, 
where you can start from negotiating. Say you start from here, then because the government has helped you to set, or the law has helped you to set at this level, then you say, you know, I have even experience of five years or 10 years in, in cooking, therefore you need to raise my salary to this level. Right. Uh, that, that one has failed. That, that, that calls for political will, kind of. There is a problem where the government is paying a lot of attention to the investors. They are looking for investors. True, wonderful idea. They want them to create more jobs. Wonderful idea. But are the workers protected? In most cases, the investor is given land, is given free tax holidays. Uh, long tax holidays, yes. Long tax holidays, and is, is almost getting free labor. Because he will employ you today, if you want to comply, the following, the following day you are sacked. He knows <coughs> he will bring another person, and he negotiates even below what you are getting. And this is what they were saying, Ronald and uh, Honorable Agnes, uh, casualization of labor. Even professionals are now working uh, as the casuals. So you find you have nowhere to start. If you are taking uh, maybe 30,000 per day, he will say, now I can get that one of 20. And there are these agents. You say, no, once you bring Segawa, he's already even to work at 10,000. Mm. So there is no starting point, basically. And that really affects our community. Even our economy. You find someone has not paid tax. He has not left money for labor, in the labor sector. He has uh, he, he, he got free land. He's repatriating everything, basically. <laughs> He's repatriating all the profits, taking them back. S some companies, even they buy food from where they come from. And come with it. And come with it. They don't even go to Nakasero market. So they import <laughs> even food. So you find someone has not even spent here even 5%. Uh, he carries all the profits and repatriates it. And we don't have law that stops them from repatriating all their uh, profits. Uh, uh, and, on the eve, and on the eve of uh, the tax holiday uh, expiring, he actually... Uh, says he, I, he's I, preparing to pack I, his things I, I and going. I'm away. bankrupt. Yeah, I'm bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> or declare himself bankrupt. Uh, Honorable Agnes, uh, <laughs> just uh, speak to this minimum wage problem because uh, for me, I think it's the it's our biggest challenge as we stand right now. Thank you. Uh, you also are aware that the minimum wage does not apply to people like you. But no. uh, as the, no, the majority as of Honorable the Ugandans, mentioned, yes. it is the minimum standard that can be set you can negotiate over and above. But now we're thinking for the informal sector people, the casual laborers, quote unquote, and they are the majority of the Ugandans. So uh, yeah. True, true. We, we, we really want that war, and we are, we are still appealing to government that they, cons they should consider this law as very important. You are aware, Honorable uh, Naito, he had moved a private member's bill and it's only that uh, His Excellency did not assent to the law. But we are it is a struggle. Mm. We shall still bring it back. back. Bring it back. <laughs> I know uh, Honorable is going to bring it back. <laughs> in a way, we have to convince the President to ensure that this law is put in place. Right. He may not be aware how workers are suffering. I think he needs to be given a lot more of details to know how we are suffering. Uh, Honorable Agnes, many thanks for that. Uh, Arnold, very, very briefly, in uh, just under a minute, just uh, wind this up with the minimum wage. How essential is it? Uh, thank you again. The minimum wage is very essential, and it's really, really sad that uh, uh, the, even the first step that was taken to have uh, uh, some form of minimum wage was not assented to. The essential, uh, like, when you connect it to a lot of the issues that we've been discussing is that Unless you have a minimum wage, you will not be able to protect some of the key uh, constituencies within the informal sector, but also uh, 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 
domestic workers or any other casual laborers. What is really important is that you cannot have a minimum wage that adds up cost because each sector is, 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 has to have its own minimum wage. Uh, you can't say if, let's say, you pass uh, a minimum wage for people in the manufacturing industry, it cannot be the same minimum wage for people in uh, and, and doing uh, a domestic work or doing a uh, 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 our professional services has been mentioned. So the use for is they need to have the lowest minimum wage that the country should never go down or go below. But also it's really important that uh, uh, any legislative framework that is passed has clear directives on what minimum wage is applied to different sectors because telecommunication mm -hmm. cannot have the same minimum wages as 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 as, as, uh, as manufacturing or production or even trading in different uh, or market right. vendors or something so there is it's important the country has a minimum wage and as we stand now we only have one that has been around for like the last 36 years or even more so until we have that then you cannot uh, have a clear uh, because like one of the things that we have totally experienced or we have seen even in areas that we work is that there's basically modern day slavery. When you look at the, the kind of money that is paid to some people, uh, you know, commensurate with the kind of work they do, you kind of shudder at how they can even survive on that. Yet there is no uh, uh, any form of, of, of parity that has been put forward to ensure that uh, uh, right. uh, uh, they are protected or they are given a certain kind of... Uh, uh, salary or wage that is a living, you know, is a living wage, or it's a, it kind of uh, uh, provides for the standard that they are expected to have. So right. the minimum wage is really long overdue, and we need to have, and the members of parliament in, in, in the studio uh, need to kind of uh, drive their colleagues to say that we have a minimum wage, and then we can work at having other sectoral minimum wages depending on on on, on, on the diff on the nature of work. But there is at least as a country we need to have. Uh, a standard, you know, minimum wage. We are the only country now in the East African region that I think we don't have a minimum wage, and it looks bad for you know uh, the region and the East African community kind right. of discussions that. We Arnold, so uh, it's. Arnold, uh, many thanks for that. I, I did want to put that out myself, but uh, Arnold Kwesiga actually did mention that we are the only country in the in the region, East Africa community, without one. Uh, Arnold Kwesiga, the coordinator of uh, UCCA, uh, just to my left, we had. Uh, we do have uh, Ari Nightway uh, Rakadja, Honorable, that is of course, uh, he's a workers MP. And to my extreme left, uh, we have Honorable Agnes Kunihira, who is uh, also a workers MP, the lady. And the gentleman, many thanks for that. Uh, happy Labor Day. Uh, looking forward to having you again. Hopefully it won't be next year. I, I think we need to carry this uh, conversation around this uh, even more. Uh, and uh, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with more Morning at NTV. Uh, Stephen Bide will be joining us.